Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's event. We are thrilled to be joined by three distinguished art historians, Michael Ohajuru, Marenka thompson Udlam, and Jasmine Chohan, to discuss race and art history from their personal and academic perspectives. Organised by the Courtauld's BAME Society, represented by myself, Ruby Bansell, and Jamie Kadera, with support from the Gender and Sexuality Research Group, this evening's event seeks to bring attention to the personal experiences and art historical approaches of scholars of colour. During the event, the panellists will highlight paths and methodologies that senior scholars have taken in the academy, as well as their limitations. Our conversation will primarily discuss decolonizing art history and decentering whiteness in the discipline. We want to hold space for both real and honest accounts of BAME experiences, whilst also reflecting on the ways the discipline is evolving for the better. We will begin with short presentations from each of our guests, which will be followed by a moderated discussion. If you have any questions during the presentations, please save them for the discussion portion. You can write your questions and comments in the chat below. Now to hand over to Jamie. Thank you so much, Ruby. And to echo um, what Ruby just said, thank you again to everyone who's listening in tonight um, and to our wonderful and esteemed uh, speakers who are here with us tonight um, to give a brief summary of their long list of accomplishments. Um, first, we have Michael Ohajuru, who is a senior fellow of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies with honors degrees in phys physics, which he received from Leeds in 1974, and art history from the Open University in 2008. Um, he retired in 2014 after a 25 year career holding senior positions in international sales and marketing in the data and mobile communications industry, um, and currently lives in South London with his partner, the artist Eben Colwyn. He blogs, writes, and speaks regularly on the Black presence in Renaissance Europe and has recently spoken at the National Gallery, the Tate Britain, British Library, National Archives, and the Victoria and Albert Museum on the subject. He is the founder of the Image of the Black in London Galleries, which is a series of gallery tours highlighting the overt and covert Black presences to be found in the National Art Collections in London. He is a project director and chief evangelist of the John Blank Project, which is a contemporary art and archive project celebrating John Blank, the Black trumpeter to courts of Henry VII and Henry VIII. Michael is the co-convener of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies' What's Happening in Black British History series of workshops fostering a creative dialogue between researchers, educationalists, archivists, curators, and policymakers, now in its fifth year. And he is also the co-convener of the Institute of Historical Research Black British History Seminar Program and a founding member of the Black Presence in British Portraiture Network, managing the BP2 podcast. Uh, next, we have Marenka thompson Odlum, who is a research associate at the Pitt Rivers Museum and a doctoral candidate at the University of Glasgow. Her doctoral research explores Glasgow's role in the transatlantic slave trade through a material culture house at Glasgow Museums. At the Pitt Rivers, she is the researcher on the label, labeling projects Labeling Matters Project, which investigates the problematic use of language within the museum space and ways of decolonization through reimagining the definition of a label. Um, and our final guest tonight is Jasmine Chohan, who is an associate lecturer and a final year PhD, PhD student here at the Courtauld Institute of Art. Um, she specializes in contemporary Cuban art, global biennials, contemporary Asian art, and contemporary British diaspora art. Having first studied Cuban art at the San Alejandro School of Fine Arts in Havana, Jasmine later completed a course in art history at the University of Havana in 2015. She continued her work in Cuba by working as an artistic producer and translator for the 12th Havana Biennial. Um, more recently, Jasmine has been researching the history of British diaspora artists. She's been collaborating with groups such as Southall Resists, the 1989 Collective, and the Brilliant Club Scholars Program to reach out to secondary schools in outer London boroughs to ensure the dissemination of this pertinent history to the next generation. To reinforce this work, Jasmine has recently collaborated with the Arts Cabinet to write the introduction to their upcoming publication on art and migration. So I hope you can welcome um, me in joining, I hope you can join me in welcoming our wonderful guests for this um, evening's event. And now I will hand it over to Jasmine who will start us off. Hi, um, I'm Jasmine Chohan. Uh, firstly, I would like to say a big thank you to Jamie and Ruby for organizing this session. Um, my 10 minute presentation 
is going to be split into two segments today. Um, it's the first section is going to focus on my time at the Courtauld um, as I've spent the best part of 11 years there. And the second section will focus on my PhD research, which is a study of the Havana Biannual and its surrounding exhibits. Um, as much as I would like to have a fluid conversation about my time at the Courtauld, this segment is going to sound quite scripted, primarily because it is. Um, if I were to openly talk about my time, it might send into a collective therapy session, which possibly most of us need, but it's not necessarily the right place for it right now. Um, nevertheless, my account will be largely anecdotal. Uh, last week, Jamie and Ruby invited Michael Marenka and I to have a short conversation to introduce ourselves and to understand the format of this event. And um, while waxing lyrical with the others, uh, the first thing that I said was that it was really nice to see the emergence of a BAME society at the Courtauld when in my day, uh, oh, so long ago, 11 years ago, the newest society on the block was a lad society. A, it was a group of overprivileged white young men who decided they were sick of being underrepresented in a predominantly white middle to upper class female environment and sought representation. They kicked off in a phenomenal fashion by hosting a curry night in Brick Lane that was promoted as a return to the jewel of the empire. Thankfully, the university did demand they pull down their promotions after some pushback from the student body. Um, in our pre-discussion discussion, Michael commented that this transition from lad society to BAME society could be a focus for a PhD alone, and he's not wrong. In my time at the Institute, I've seen the Courtauld change from a place where I was the only brown skinned student in the entire university to a 10% increase in BAME students and staff. I've seen the curriculum change from two weeks dedicated to art from other countries at the end of the BA1 Foundations course to a full three months course, well, two to full three month courses and master's programs dedicated to the study of contemporary art from countries outside of Europe and North America. The Courtauld has made a concerted effort to be more inclusive and curate their curriculum to move away from the Eurocentric canon and they are trying to give a space to people of color and, and art from countries other than Europe and North America. This word give has always sat strangely with me. It connotes a gifting for which we should be entirely grateful. When teaching the partition of India and Pakistan to my secondary school students and to my undergraduate students, I asked them why in British textbooks, they state that Britain gave independence, India its independence instead of India taking it. Taking suggests something more violent, more uncomfortable, more confrontational. It suggests having a right or an agency an agency that most white people in the art world assume, but one that is reserved from people of color, especially those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. When considering my time at the Courtauld, I cannot count the number of times I was told by fellow students in my year group, I was given a place at the Institute because I was the token brown girl, that I was given a scholarship or travel back grant because the Institute needed to fill a quota, not because I was smart enough or deserved it or that it was my right to take. They said this in jest and I took it in my stride as sadly one becomes desensitized to these microaggressions. While the Institute itself has unfailingly supported me throughout my studies, the rhetoric around positive discrimination must change. It's not a gift to be given a place because you are of color. It is our right when these spaces have been actively closed off from us for so long. This is a linguistic change that needs to occur as well as evidently being a psychological shift. The full decentering of whiteness or Eurocentricness in institutions seems next to impossible. A lot of these structures are hardwired into, hardwired into institutions, including the Courtauld. During my time at the Courtauld, I frequently worked with its outreach team that did really great work with schools in the peripheral parts of London and worked to open up the Courtauld's collection to a demographic of kids who would usually be unaware of the existence of the gallery or the institution. However, the minute the students entered the institute, you could feel their discomfort. One kid said to me, Miss, everything is so white, even the buildings. It's not a surprise they felt this way as I had on many occasions too. It is important to state that this is not exclusively a problem of the Courtauld. I believe these problems are the same, if not worse, in other elite institutions. I've had my fair share of horror stories and people studying in places like Oxford and Cambridge. 
It is also not limited solely to universities either. It is a problem that is systemic in our country as a whole, but yes, particularly concentrated in the art world. To create this decentering, it may simply take the full decentering of institutions to shift to achieve this shift. COVID has given us an opportunity to implement these changes, as historically we know a large rupture is needed for great change to occur. And indeed, we have seen some of these changes taking place through movements like BLM, a movement that also forced a court hold into a period of deep reflection. However, to effect real change, I believe we must intervene at an earlier stage in the education system. I'm currently working with secondary school kids teaching history while also running extracurricular art history classes. The history syllabus I've created attempts to redefine how we look at history. Instead of simply learning about slavery, we learn about the African kingdoms that existed before slavery. Instead of focusing solely on the kings and queens of England, we look at history of migration dating back as far as the Celts and the Picts, running all the way through to Windrush, to Enoch Powell's River of Blood speech, and then we consider the way in which immigration helped build this country, rebuild this country after World War II. To decenter whiteness in the art world, we must show non-white students as young as 11 or 12 that they have an artistic heritage in this country. Now I come to the second part of my presentation, where I'll briefly describe my research and how I've tried to focus on art away from the historic European canon. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of or are aware of the Havana Biennial. I first stumbled into this area after a strange secondary school exchange with my West London High School and an art school in Havana, San Alejandro. Needless to say, the 17 year old me fell madly in love with the country, which then eventually grew into an obsession. Um, one of the things that most attracted me to Cuba was a strange feeling of familiarity on the island that bordered on belonging. It was as if the island was full of people who sat between two worlds and coexisted in them both. These two worlds I speak of are outdatedly termed third world and first world. The Cuban people descend from all corners of the planet and few are able to trace their lineage back past three generations. It's a melting pot of cultures and races and yet the two clearly defined roots of the ties to the global south while being engulfed by the culture, traditions and architecture of North America and Spain. Renowned art critic Gerardo Mosquera once described the Latin American man's tussle between these two worlds and how their fraught existence was an attempt to find a place between those worlds. He went on to explain that the Cubans have to some extent reconciled these divides. This tussle is one that I experience daily as a second generation Punjabi girl growing up in London. It is most concentrated when I am participating in the Western art world and it's an existence that I'm still trying to reconcile to a large extent. After studying the politics and history of Cuba, I came across the country's role in the non-aligned movement and how Castro attempted to create global South-South links with countries that were termed third world. When researching the way in which Castro attempted to unite the third world, the Havana Biennial established in 1984 was at the forefront of this strategy. The Cuban president utilized the biennial format to spearhead a move to unite and represent the third world. It was an act of soft power. This was not the first time or the last time the biannual was used with this intention. In fact, it seems as if Castro got the idea from Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nasser had started the Biennale de Méditerranée in, in 1955 to bring Mediterranean countries from both sides of the Iron Curtain together, while assuring that the move maneuvered him to the top of the political pyramid in Egypt. Away from the political tensions of the Havana Biennial, the results of the first three editions were groundbreaking and artists who had never encountered each other as there was little international space available for non-Western artists came together and formed lifelong connections. This included diasporic artists from Western countries. In the second year of my PhD, I started exploring the roles those artists played in the biennial and discovered a black arts movement that had happened in my own city 30 to 40 years ago that I was entirely oblivious to. It struck me that it took me until the second year of my PhD, after having studied art history for six years at that point, before I encountered artists from my own background in the UK. Thankfully, I had the guiding hand of artists and curators from generations before me, such as Shaheen Morali, to help me navigate and uncover this world. It was an area I became more and more interested in as it spoke to my background and helped me find a place in the art world. It resulted in a conference I co-organized 
at the courts held in 2019, based on three art events that took place in 1989. The Third Havana Biennial, The Other Story at the Hayward Gallery, and The Invisible Colors, an international women of color and third world women film slash video festival. To see such a mixed crowd attending a court hold event was inspiring and captured the change that is occurring at the Institute. Recently, the Courtauld has pushed forward and acted upon their attempts to widen the canon by appointing Professor Dorothy Price, who I think I saw here in the list of attendees, and India A. Chowdhury to do new permanent faculty roles in the field of modern and contemporary art and visual culture with specialisms, specialisms in critical race art history, Black studies, the arts of Africa, and its global diasporas. Going back to my research, Fundamentally, my PhD analyzes the Havana Biennial within a local Cuban and global socio-political context and looks at the way in which the Biennial has mutated to serve the purposes of the Cuban state, be it through creating groundbreaking connections between third world countries, reinforcing Latin American ties such as the Alba Group, or simply by creating another space that will fuel tourism. Um, I'm gonna leave this discussion here as I'm very aware that I'm pushing my 10 minutes and I'm sure we'll revisit some of these points in our discussion later on. For now, I would like to pass it back to Ruby and Jamie and once again, thank them for starting this discussion. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, that was really wonderful and a great um, history, historical look into the court hold um, as well. Um, we're, gonna look, we're gonna move on to Michael next, um, who will start his presentation. I want to thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. This is a real on this really important topic, something which is really close to my heart, because my image of the Black Tours is really addresses this issue, and it's it's my chance to say why I do this, because it really is it really addresses this issue that was then, what is now in terms of much of the art we have in our London galleries was from a a, a, a time when when black people were in a different position to what they are today. So how do we, how do we make, make, make that change? How do we reference or reflect the way we treat black people different today? You know, and, and, and we, this retain and explain, what does that really mean? How can we make that factual? And that, that, that's what I'm concerned with. And that's my, my practice about how do we make that change real reflect who we are today as a society? Uh, like it was prompted by this, it was an exhibition a couple of years ago at Tate, uh, Tate Britain, but it's Baroque. And there was a sign on the door or the entrance that says, uh, content guidance. Paintings in this exhibition depict black people in a demeaning way. For more information, please seek a visitor assistant. So this is just like a warning, uh-uh, be careful. There's something here you might be offended by. Well, this, this, this is the painting here. As the dishes, but Madison as Diana, and she's surrounded by these um, these black these black children uh, and, uh, with, with slave collars, and they've got dogs there. And to the the people at Tate who saw this, they thought this was a demeaning picture, so they needed to be warned. And I when I, and I took people around Tate, and we didn't go into the exhibition. We just kind of stood around and talked about the sign here. And the consensus was, I'm, we're not offended by this. We're predominantly black people. We're not offended by this. We're more offended by the fact you think we'll be offended. And it's that, that whiteness in action here. And there's, there's a lot going on in terms of embarrassment. We don't want to offend. When there, we see even the, the many more worse pictures than this we see daily with black people in being um, overruled by white people. But they took exception at this particular image. And for me, it was, it was a, they, they were oversensitive. They, they'd gone too far in the kind of defenseness of, the, of their whiteness or protecting our blackness. I don't know quite what they, what they were trying to say. Either way, myself and others thought this was, we didn't need protecting from this kind, of, this kind of images. Because if you look at the black people in history, the black people in art, in canonical Western European art, which is the art I predominantly talk about in our galleries here. We look at, I talk about the age of enlightenment, straddling the, the age of enslavement. We look at the, the this is the this is a graph of the slave trade and, uh, and enslaved people across the Atlantic over the from the 16th to the 19th century, and it, it that straddles the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment was a, was was a time when people were reconsidering who they were as human beings, men were, were. so and there's, I recognize kind of three distinct periods before enslavement and after enslavement, 
the black presence is is is, is changed you know in a, in the in representation because in the enlightenment we we um when you develop the idea of, of blackness, says Hume talks about, I'm apt to suspect the Negro in general, all other species of men, to be naturally inferior to the whites. This white superiority was built into the Enlightenment. Here's, here's Jefferson, a slave owner. He talked about, he, he never seen an elementary trait of painting or sculpture from a black. They, they had no culture. Well, we have, we have the Kant, whoops, let me go again. Kant talks about this fellow was black, clear proof he was stupid just because he was black. This is a, Kant, one of the great philosophers of all time, saw blackness as stupidity. And then Hegel, Hegel, he talks about Africa as of no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development, no history. Africa has no history. And that continues even to this day. You know, you've got uh, Trevor Yopa, Hugh Trevor Yopa, perhaps in the future, there'll be some African history to teach. But at present, there is none. Only the history of Europeans in Africa, the rest is darkness. And then this 2000, Sarkozy, the tragedy of Africa is that the African has no fully entered into history. They have never launched themselves into the future. This is this this nonsense is with us today, and that, that, that's shrouded in this whiteness or white superiority. And that's why I rail against. And you meet many people who say, "No, these these ideas are wrong. We are different today." Well, my 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 my, my response is, "Well, how different?" Because you look, we, we've invented this idea of the Negro. And this idea of the Negro, that, that's the pure enlightenment invention. They had no country, no civilization, no culture, no religion, no history, no place. And finally, no humanity that commands consideration. And that, that thought of the Negro pervades, pervades the art of the period. And you know, you, we're not going to rewrite history. No, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to, how do we respond to it? How do we explain it? And that's the challenge we have. Um, and if you approach it with an open mind, rather than the, the guilt and the defensiveness of Tate in terms of you're going to be offended, that is not the place, that, that, that is certainly not the place to start. And I'll, I'll show you kind of little baby steps. There's a painting here from the National Portrait Gallery of, and, and this was, this was a 2000, uh, 2000 it, was, it, oops, probably people, it was for many years known as Sir John Chardine with an unknown male attendant. Now, that's what it was known as today. That's, you know, that's not say, but for years it was known as Sir John Chardin. There was no reference to his male attendance, and that, that was up to January 21. It was, had to, so they changed it in February. They changed it in, in February to add the, an unknown male assistant. Now that's a little baby step, but I see that part of opening it up, you know, opening the the art and the works to to understanding a black presence, at least recognizing it. And the next challenge is, well, let's find out who, who that black figure is. Who, who is that black boy? What, what part did he play in Sir John's life that he wanted to be portrayed in his painting? How important he was. So, so as I say, these, these are baby steps on the way to kind of, of showing how we're different now, how, how, we, how we look for equality. And for me, a seminal text for, for, for my work is the image of the black in Western art. And it's where I take, um, where I take the name of my uh, of, of my image of the black in London gallery from, and Dominique Manel, she, she was a philanthropist, the wealthy philanthropist who funded this book at the time of the um, civil rights movement in in, in the late sixties, where you saw black people that were black people did have a place in art, they were celebrated, and she wanted to do that, she wanted to show that in in in, in these books, but she said a brilliant expression here. She talks about she said all have been cast, all black people have been cast in Western European art. We cast in roles they did not choose. They are actors in plays they did not write. So we're there, but we didn't write the play. So the challenge we have now is to understand what is that play and, and tease it out. And that to me is the journey that we're on, to understand those plays and, and know more about them, the black presence and equally the white presence, how they work together. Because I, I recognize, as I say, three distinct periods, before enslavement and after. If you look at before enslavement, but black people in art, well, they weren't, they weren't, they, they, they took various forms. They weren't, they weren't committed to one particular style. But if we look in the Enlightenment, so in the Enlightenment, corresponding to enslavement, you see the black figure is peripheral, marginal, uh, supporting the white figure, very supporting the white figure. And today, we, after this life, it's a question of recovering the black image, the black identity. Here's a, an artist friend of mine, Kofi. Him, he's reflecting on himself and his heritage. It's that reflection with not, today artists given the opportunity to reflect on who they are and how they relate to the canon, how they relate to the past. And it's that openness, allowing artists to go on that journey. 
and understand the, the, how the black figure has been demonized and for, for specific reasons, because white people didn't see them as having um, and, and any part in society, as I say, no history. But we, we, we've changed now, or oh, many people say they've changed. So how have you changed? Uh, and and it's, that's what I'm looking for. And actually a brilliant example by Titus Kafour. He's taken this, this, this portrait here of uh, the, the Eli Yale of, of Yale University. He's over in England looking for a, a, a daughter, a daughter for his son, a, a wife for his son. And the, 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 it takes the opportunity to take a portrait, a picture, a, a snapshot him with, with the Duke of Devonshire. And what Titus does with this painting, he, he takes the black figure, as Titus there, and he does this with it. And he says, enough of you, enough of you. Let's put a center. Now, that's what I'm looking for, creative responses to try and understand the black presence in, uh, in art of the day. So to bring it out and then go on to, to, to explain it, but make it real. So you don't have this nonsense where you have people, people being offended by, by an image. So look, that was then. What is now? What are we doing now to address this whiteness in terms of whiteness is not the only narrative. I mean, blackness has a part to play. So look, I'm going to finish on that point. I'm looking forward to discussing this further with, uh, with, with, the, with the rest of the folks, with, 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 with Jasmine and Marenka on, on, on the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was um, really, really energetic and exciting um, presentation for us all and a chance to see what your, um, what your uh, teaching is like. Um, so last, we're going to move on to uh, Marenka, who's also going to share a presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Marenka, and I work at the Pitt Rivers Museum, which is one of the University of Oxford museums. Um, I'm going to say right off the bat that the Pitt Rivers Museum is an uh, archae archaeological and anthropological museum. So a lot of my examples will skew that way. But um, I think that you would, I hope, hope that you still find it very useful. Um, today I'm going to talk a lot about kind of the work that I'm currently doing, um, but I, I am actually going to start with a bit of art history though. Um, there we go. Um, so that was actually great to have uh, Michael go right before me because I think it really helps like lead in um, into how I'm going to begin. And this is a painting um, that was part of that I worked on as part of my um, my PhD work in Glasgow, and it is of John Glassford and family. That is the title as it is in the um, uh, Glasgow museums. And um, as you can see on the right side, behind John Glassford, there is a um, young um, enslaved African um, servant. And so John Glassford was a very prominent tobacco merchant and slave owner um, resided residing in Glasgow, there is a street name after him. Um, and yeah, and so this is one of the, like, the images that kind of prompted my um, doctoral work. And then when I went to working with the museums, I'm trying to look at the ways that, you know, the material culture in the museums, kind of what they told us about Glasgow's um, kind of history and connection with the transatlantic slave trade, I found that it was actually really difficult to find objects. Um, because one of the reasons were like in the cataloging in a database, you know, the black presence, the enslaved presence just wasn't there, it wasn't cataloged. Um, and I tried all like the euphemistic terms that I thought it might be under, again, just wouldn't appear. And as you can see, this says John Glassford and family, no mention of um, the young African boy in the corner. And as Michael said, very much marginalized, pushed to almost the end of the painting, almost not even there. Um, and, you know, the kind of sad thing is, it took me a while to kind of think about like what was wrong with this title, um, you know, cause I guess you, I was so programmed with going to museums and not even seeing, you know, the black prince's presence documented in the um, titles that for a while, then it almost seemed normal. Um, what I think struck, stuck out more to me was the fact that even within the catalog description, the description of the painting um, for a while, there was, an act, there was no mention of the enslaved boy. Um, and then I kind of gradually gets, but, but if there's no mention of him there and like, but he should also be in the title, he's part of this image. 
Uh, and this kind of just got me thinking about, you know, the way we catalog, um, the way we put things on our database, the way we interpret um, and label um, art and objects. And so, you know, kind of really fueled my work at the Pitt Rivers Museum, uh, which I'm going to, and it kind of started asking me questions about, you know, what, what systems and what type of knowledge that we produce that kind of enables this kind of erasure to continue. Um, and so that's what my work at the Pitt Rivers looks about, looks at. Um, so um, most of the, well, a lot of the objects at the Pitt Rivers actually are from, well, many of them are from Europe, but also the bulk of them are from uh, different cultural groups from all around the world, uh, which means then that you have a very interesting, I say interesting in the worst way possible, um, array of how things are described. What you have in front of you are some old labels that are no longer on display. They're old labels. Um, but as you can see, a lot of problematic language. Um, and because we have objects from all over the world, you find that language creating this kind of you know, othering you know, and dichotomy between um, objects that are from kind of white or Eurocentric cultures and objects that are, are not. Um, and so, uh, and, yeah, and then you have, and again, you find kind of language, very, very kind of overtly offensive language um, that you can see here in the top. Um, this old label says black fellows message stick. That's a term that was used um, to describe um, Aboriginal Australian peoples. Um, here on the beadwork one, uh, you can see the word it begins with K. I don't say it because it's so it's very offensive, but it's an offensive term to refer to Black South African peoples, um, and that is on many objects labels in the museum of the old labels, but also physically written on the objects because a lot of the art and um, artifacts came from field work, so anthropologists. Um, and so when they went to the field, they would literally just write these things onto the objects itself. Um, and so you have that, you know, occurring a lot. Um, and then you have what I like, or I turn the more euphemistic language in which again, whiteness and Eurocentrism is centered. And I should say the white narrative is centered. Um, this is an image of the Benin bronzes. Um, we have a case of them within the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, and you can see the current case label, which is tragic to say the least. Is extremely euphemistic in the way that it says it calls us it says a small party of British officials and traders um, says that they were ambushed in Benin um, in retaliation the British military force attacked the city and then after that you know all these artworks were just brought to the to Europe um, seems very kind of you know kind of doesn't capture the entire like it doesn't actually use it to punitive expedition of 1897 which is what it was termed at the time. Um, it doesn't talk about how the city was basically like sacked, raised, burned down, plundered, um, how people were killed. Um, it doesn't really talk about that. Uh, it doesn't say that the military force was like a thousand strong that came in afterwards. It also treats British officials and traders as these benign agents when we know actually they were very like much agents of colonialism as well. Um, and so again, this is and yes, using the term retaliation, you know, as though this is something not taking into consideration, you know, the great amount of resources and wealth that the um, British government wanted to control um, that, that, was, that was then in the hands of the Oba or the um, king of, you know, the Benin kingdom. So it's just really interesting on how the kind of the story <laughs> that is being told while in the new short guide version, on the other hand, um, you can tell that it was rewritten to be a lot more honest um, and truthful about what happened using terms specifically like looting as well. Um, and yeah, and so I think, you know, it's very interesting. I just always think that is a really interesting example to use. Um, and then we have kind of talking about, I think Jasmine mentioned Canon. Um, this is, I always like to use this example. This is an image of a case, one of the cases in the museum, as you can see, very tightly packed. This is one of the charms of the, the Pit Rivers. Um, and it's case 150A. I don't know why I know that, um, but it's the case heading is human form and art. Um, 
And there are two cases for human formula, 159A, 149A, and 150A. And it's very, very interesting because everyone's like, oh, you know, there's just two cases, but under the same heading, not much difference. But then when you actually look closer into the history of the case headings um, and the displays, you kind of get this picture starting to, you know, form. And so case um, 150A used to be called human form in savage art, then barbaric art, and then you have the division occurring and you have 149 becoming civilized, human form in civilized art, and then 150 becoming human form in barbaric art. And then they change the heading again to development and degradation of human form in art. You, you can guess which one was which. Um, and then you get tribal and folk, and then you get finally in 2002, just human form in art. Um, and what's interesting about these two cases is that guess what's under civilized and guess what's in the barbaric art, right? So the images at the bottom, here you have um, one's Egyptian, uh, one's uh, medieval Europe European, and the other one is Roman, um, classical Roman. And so talking very much about the art historical, but also archeological canon and those, you know, those empires and objects that also kind of talk about the development of, of Eurocentrism and whiteness. And, and has been brought into that specific canon. That's what's in you know, the case that used to be termed civilized art or development of human form and art. Um, and then the other case is from all of the art from all of the cultural groups that you know don't for, don't don't fit the canon, don't fit the story, the Eurocentric narrative that has been created. Um, and so even though we don't use those terms anywhere, civilized and barbaric or savage it is still in the database because everything's recorded, but the display still very much holds up those hierarchies. Um, and so instead of all these things actually being displayed side by side, we've, we've created at least now, if not linguistically, a visual kind of um, division between the two. Um, and one that is still centering whiteness as being civilized on this kind of linear, you know, quote unquote, false linear progression um, of, of society. Um, so one of the things I had to ask myself was before I can even go with descent, decentering whiteness, I had to like fully understand all the ways in which coloniality and whiteness kind of are upheld and reinforced in the museum. Um, and that's much like very hard to do. There are these, the very you know, blatant ways that you can see, you know, when you can see, for example, the enslaved person being left out of the title or the description. Um, you can see it in using derogatory terms for um, people of color. Um, you can see it, well, if you know the background at least, in how that the division, um, the canon and the non-canon. But there are all these other ways in which, you know, we reinforce this every day within um, museum practice and art historical practice, actually practicing all types of practice, actually. Um, and how do you break that down? And so one of my first tasks at the Pit Rivers was literally creating a survey or review, a review of all um, the problematic language within the museum, which I don't know if you've ever been to the Pit Rivers, but those labels are extremely tiny. All the cases are jam packed and there are three stories of it and 500,000 objects, manuscripts, photographs. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy job. Anyway, so kind of, I decided to use a framework kind of based on um, the Latin American scholar, uh, Anibal Criano's um, Colonial Matrix of Power, um, which just basically talks about kind of all the, you know, we have, or it talks about the kind of all the structures that still uphold coloniality. Um, and I kind of whistled this down to three basic questions that I would ask myself every time I went to every case and I looked at every label. Um, and all the interpretation. And those questions is, does this label or display or anything actually, I should say, um, establish hierarchies? And when I say hier hierarchies, I mean very much false hierarchies, but um, usually uh, racial hierarchies, hierarchies around labor, although those usually kind of cross the lines, um, intersect. Um, does this um, also hierarchies around um, gender? Uh, and then does the label assign power to and privilege the production of Eurocentric knowledge. Yes, one of the main reasons why is because every single person who wrote all the labels in that museum were not actually from the cultural groups who created them and were usually, you know, white Oxford-based 
curators, um, professors, because we are a research and teaching museum. Um, and then lastly, does this um, impose white Eurocentric culture? And so I'm just gonna, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably running out of time. So I'm gonna go like really quickly and kind of illustrate what I mean about, talk about that. So when I talked about like, does it produce and privilege white Eurocentric knowledge? In the center here, um, the center square is the original label from our opium case, um, which has a lot of um, objects relating to opium. Um, some of them are carved artworks, a lot of them are pipes, which are opium pipes from the 19th century, which in themselves are artworks, very beautiful. Um, but it's just really interesting because first of all, it starts off with opium is an illegal narcotic, which is just really interesting concept because one, it's very much, again, from that curatorial third person voice, authoritative, but I never knew that legality was universal, right? That there's no such thing as universal legality, but it starts with opium is illegal narcotic. That's it. It's extremely value laden as a negative, um, doesn't really talk about the scope of opium use historically um, or currently. Um, and yeah, and then again, just places this uni like universal legality over something, which is not universal, but very much a Western concept of legality and narcotics. Um, and then again, uses the term pap or the um, scientific term, the main term papa ver somniferum, which no one knows that's the like scientific term for opium. Let's be real honest, like why are you using this? There are so many other colloquial terms around the world used for it. But again, it's this idea that this is, you know, the universal name for something. It is not the universal name. It is the scientific name created, um, but you know, within this um, Eurocentric idea of science and then kind of exported around the world. Yay, colonialism. Um, and then it goes on to talk about China, only China really, twice. So again, really interesting because um, kind of negating the history, reinforcing the stereotype of opium and Chinese culture, but and negating all the wider context of that history and all the other like culture groups and nations involved. But the biggest like omission is the fact that all these objects were mainly from the 19th century, mid 19th century to early 20th century. And why are they in the museum? Because of the opium wars. There were two of them in case you didn't know. And the British sanctioned opium trade. Um, and so it's like, that is not anywhere to be found. That is completely removed. Um, the opium trade is called, re referred to as a thriving trade had developed, which when I hear thriving, I think of more something positive. Um, but again, erases the fact that while it might be thriving for, um, the British colonial government as one of the biggest sources of revenue in the 19th century, it was actually devastating for a lot of other um, communities, specifically um, uh, Indian farmers, you know, who were basically either like their land was um, taken or they were forced to produce opium for um, this trade um, for China, who um, had to secede some of their land during the opium wars, um, but also were just basically forced um, to, to consume opium. Uh, it also talks about, you know, um, some of the Aboriginal Australian um, people who were European settlers basically got them hooked on opium during this kind of, you know, legally sanctioned trade as a way to force them into labor because um, they would pay them in opium ash, which is basically the dregs of opium. And then they would have, to, and because they were hooked on it, they would work to get paid in more opium ash and this whole cycle of devast like you know um of devastation would just continue and continue and continue so yeah but none of that you know and so this is kind of i try to this is all from a kind of intervention i did so i try to kind of pick apart and show visitors how um you know we're very much cent centering a eurocentric form of knowledge and ideas within this um and you know that you can't really take any of this as face value. Uh, very well, where I'm going to, I'm going over time. Um, uh, lastly, so one of them is I talked about kind of the, the imposing of um, white um, Eurocentric culture, which happens, as I said, a lot in the museum and museum interpretation. Um, this is for a Hawaiian feather cloak, which is very beautiful um, from the 1840s. 
but the entire thing kind of really imposes how um, European, and so when this was collected, we could say Victorian European um, gender norms onto this object, um, you know, by very much centering um, the male presence, the male and the male and the male European presence over um, uh, women, which is really interesting because this entire, the whole entire narrative around this cloak was actually, it was given by um, the female um, Kohina Nui. Um, that is like, I guess the closest thing would be like a prime minister. She was like, the, you know, kind of second in charge to um, King Kamehameha III. It was given to George Simpson for his wife. Um, but that kind of whole, his wife's never actually mentioned um, her name. She's not named, he's named. Her name is Mary Ramsey Simpson, by the way. Um, and they call they call Kea Kalui the lady premier of King Kamehameha the third. So basically, all the women in this, and even the donors, if you can see on the other side, are all referred to in relation to the men around them, um, even though they are actually the active participants and agents within the story of a narrative of of this object. Um, so yeah, I thought that's like really interesting to me, um, and what's even more interesting is the fact that this is done because we say that feather cloaks are mainly used within, um, you know, like the male realm of power in um, Hawaiian society, which is actually, you know, not very, not true because we have paintings of um, King Kamehameha III's sister wearing a Hawaiian feather cloak. Um, queen Liliuokalani, who was the last queen of Hawaii. Um, even though she's dressed in full Victorian garb, her throne behind her is draped in a feather cloak. So here we do have, and, and in this, Kea Kului, a woman, is gifting it to another woman. Uh, so here we have like actual, we're seeing that um, ancestral lineage, you know, actually trumps gender, but because this is so written in from a specific like Eurocentric narrative, we're, we're completely like, forgetting that and um, creating a narrative that basically fits, you know, what we think is true. Um, and I'm realizing that I'm over, so I'm actually gonna stop right there and finish my other slides. And yeah, welcome questions. Thank you, Marenka, that was really great. So um, now we're going to move on to the um, Q&A portion of tonight's event. Um, and we welcome any questions in the chat, um, further engagement from the audience um, with anything that any of our speakers have said tonight. But um, I'm gonna kick it off by asking a few questions. Um, the first one being um, just about yourselves and your background, but how did your interest in art history begin and um, whether there are certain figures or role models that have been influential to you and um, maybe your particular field of interest as well. Oh, and I can, we can start with um, Jasmine since I see her mic is off and then we'll go to um, Michael and then Marenka. Um, well, my journey into my art history was a bit strange. Um, initially, I wanted to study, I think this is the story of many art history students, wanted to study fine art, got told by my aunt, no, don't do that. The arts are too volatile, do something more formal. And so then kind of tried my hand at the Courtauld, but I only came across the Courtauld um, after going to this open day for a law course at LSE. Um, and then saw this name pop up onto the screen and decided to go and check it out. Um, and it kind of all stemmed from my art teacher from my sixth form, who was this crazy Marxist socialist radical who would teach um, life drawing after school and talk through art history with us and not specifically Western art history, but kind of global art history. Um, and so I was really considering between SOAS and the Courtauld, but I guess, you know, the Courtauld is such a pretty building. I was like that one. Um, and so it kind of started there and it's only through also going back to Cuba so many times that my interest was really sparked in Cuban art. It was always, I was always more pulled towards Latin American arts, the like Cuban and Mexican, et cetera. Um, and started to really understand a lot about my own background through reading Latin American texts um, predominantly and 
um, texts on hyphenated identities and understanding modernism from uh, away from a Eurocentric perspective. Um, and then, of course, engaging in this whole other world in London that I wasn't aware of for a very long time. So too long. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, my route into all of this, um, which is, I think, pretty traditional. <laughs> I came really late to art. I was in my forties. I was I was I was a scientist, physics graduate. I was into communications, mobile phones, WAP, internet, and all that. And my wife gave me a my wife at the time gave me a book on art. I had some pictures of Botticelli, and I just loved the pictures. You know, just graphic pictures. I got into Botticelli, and that drifted me into the Medici's. And I loved the power and patronage of the Medici's. I loved that whole Florentine thing. I, I loved that and the way they, they could purchase art and, and how corrupt they were. But I loved it. I, I loved it. And, and I really got into it. Particularly, I got into history painting. Again, it was the very narratives in history painting. You could tell a story. You know, if you knew the history, you could unpick it. And the artist did this. So, so, so I, I, it was that that really got me going. And I, I, I did a degree in it at the OU very late on. 2008, but it was my final year TMA, my tutor marked assignment, my big essay at the end was on the Black Magus. This is a figure from Devon, a, a, from 1520, a Black Magus in Devon, a Black man in Devon in 1520. And that for me was WTF. You know, it was just outstanding because my mom always used to say, it was always good to see your face. So I was always interested in the Black presence in art, but when you saw it so stuffed, it's so going back so far, so that, that that image really changed my life. That panel of the VA with its black presence. It's quite a crude English painting. You know, it's, it's no Veronese, Titian, and Tintoretto. This is this is pure English, uh, you know, jobbing art. But it's a wonderful piece of art with a black presence. To say there were not okay, the, we can discuss the black presence in Britain at that time. The, the interesting things to have to say about that. But at least the, the, the idea of a black person as king. Come on, what's going on there? At the time, you know, black, black people were slaves at that time. So what was going on in people's minds? And I'm still trying to unpick that mind that can have a black king, yet at the same time have servants. So that's, that, that's me and uh, my, my introduction into art. Um, and for me, well, where does the story begin? <laughs> um, so I grew up in St. Lucia, it's an island in the Caribbean. Um, where, so we didn't have a museum at all. Um, uh, and we didn't offer, it was it's just like art. We had Caribbean art, local artists, um, but I, f I still feel you don't actually get the recognition they deserve um, at all. Um, so actually my first kind of foray into like art and art history was again for the very kind of, again, as we keep on talking about Canon, European artists. Um, and that actually came when, this is going to be a ridiculous story. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but growing up, there was this ship that came to St. Lucia like every four or five years. It's called the Logos. It um, was basically like a, it was a bookstore, but in a cruise ship, on a cruise ship. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a European charity, like Christian charity. Um, and that was like the highlight of my life, right? You know, it's like love books. It's just like, there's a ship that is coming and it has books and you know it got traveled all around the world um usually to quote unquote third world countries um and you know thinking it back then i still didn't really think of like why were half the things like books of bibles and encyclopedias but again you were just like so happy you didn't really think that they were already kind of inculcating you into like a very standard way of like um when I say standard, I mean as in Eurocentric, like a Western standard way of thinking. And so many of the books that I got, like I got there, I mean, my mom buy for me on that ship when it came every few years, were books on kind of um, on art history. Um, and you know, and I, I still have them when I go home. They still have the stickers that say like 1500 units because they went all over the world. They couldn't use one um, currency. So they made up a, like a, a currency. Um, yeah. And so when I go home now, it's like all these like basically like, you know, white artists are on my shelf. Uh, and so, you know, when I then went to undergrad in the States, um, even though I did study anthropology, um, art history was my minor. And again, it was like the same, although luckily we did have a very good, um, one of our professors, um, 
taught a lot on different um, aspects of um, Asian art um, history classes. So that actually kind of started to broaden my perspective. Um, but yeah, and then I moved to London to Christie's um, where I did my master's and it was basically right back into the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, and so I guess it wasn't, yeah. And with, but I did the kind of start exploring more about kind of art and the kind of, you know, the exchanges between um, different places and, you know, thinking more along those lines, especially because in my undergrad, I've done a lot of kind of post-colonial literature and those kind of ideas I started bringing into my art historical ideas. And then when I did my, got my PhD in Glasgow, then I kind of went full tilt um, into that. And so that's my kind of journey. Um, and also I see some top questions for me in the chat, but should I wait until afterwards to no, I was just going to actually turn to those. So obviously, Alison Hall has asked a question specific to you, Marenka, which is there's been some discussion and debate about Glasgow's enslavers and representations of them in Glasgow. How, have you been involved in that? And how do you see that developing? And then I'd also like to extend Alison's second question, which is to all of you, which is, is there anything problematic about the many representations of Black people in the servant attendant role? Um, so yeah, so Glasgow's and slaves and representation. So I no longer I live in Oxford now, obviously, but um, uh, yeah. So actually, <laughs> when I first went to Glasgow, that was kind of the whole talk about Glasgow and slavery was just starting. Like my collaborative doctoral program was kind of part of that, you know, kind of impetus to start looking at um, Glasgow's connection um, and was Scotland's connection to slavery um, for you know. A lot of times before that, it was always seen as like an English problem, not something Scotland had been involved in. But seeing that Glasgow literally thrived and like became Glasgow based on um, slavery, it was a reckoning <laughs> that was about to come. So yeah, um, and yeah, so there. So I have been involved in. So I was involved in the um, Glasgow University. You know, they came out was it the two years ago with the um, kind of talking about all the money that had been like, or that University of Glasgow has is in connection to, and basically creating this whole like the center, but also bursaries and in a way kind of a reparations um, plan. And so, yeah, my colleagues and I were part of, you know, the steering committee for that, um, put it kind of doing all the research um, towards that. And um, yeah, and I mean, <laughs> Done like a bunch of documentaries and like radio talk show programs about kind of you know the fact that all the basically all the street names in Glasgow city centre are named after um, you know enslavers, um, tobacco and sugar merchants, uh, and yeah, and a lot of and and I did walking tours um, of Glasgow, so kind of you know looking at the architecture um, and the artwork from that perspective and trying to kind of. Get people talking about, about it and it was yeah people really liked it um it was very interesting because that means we had to go to the, into the cathedral the high cathedral on a sat a sunday and i think the um organ like <laughs> the organist who literally tried to compete with me because i'd be talking about like the fact that slave owners were buried in the cathedral in the nave and all of a sudden you'd start hearing Dah! really loudly <laughs> um, this is after after service but still um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on. It's still going on. Like, I'm really, I love when I keep on seeing new things coming out. I think they did a kind of a virtual walking tour now, but also kind of um, including um, more kind of artistic um, perspective as well. So uh, I think it's called Ghost. Um, and I really want to, yeah, um, see that. So that's, yeah. And then Michael, I thought maybe you actually might be best primed to respond to Alison's second question, which is, is there anything problematic about the many representations of black people in the servant um, slash attendant role? I think you're muted. I was off, I was off. This is a difficult question. You can say on the surface, yes, it is problematic, it's wrong. But on the other hand, and, and I've given this a lot of thought, you're talking about people who came here with nothing, have no property, any, had no sense of, oh, they have no, their identity has been taken away from them. They were not, they, they were Ben, Laura in a record, an age, that's all they were. I think this, these, these, things, these paintings are important because they're a record, they existed. We were there, they were there. 
We may not like the fact, that, but at least we know they were there. They're more than just a record in a in a in a, um, a slavery um, uh, directory. Because someone challenged me to say about well, Rembrandt was a racist because he painted sla slavers. Reynolds was a slaver because he painted slavers. But I would I would argue this: those those paintings of white people in power are just as important as the marginalized black presence because they're a record. They say what happened, they're just as important as those slave records, the slavery compensation database, because they tell the whole story. And that story is still being told. Like there's some, you know, Rebecca Hall, she's done a book uh, just come out, Wake, the hidden history of, um, of, of, of black, uh, black enslaved women, where she wants to go into the archives in, in Lloyd's to look in there and she was kicked out, they wouldn't go in. But, but the New York Times, as part of the 1616, 1619 project, identified London as the base for slave mortgages. Long after the abolished slavery, 1807, in the 1850s, 60s, mortgages on slaves were being funded here from Britain. The trade continued. So we're not, the whole story hasn't been told. So for me, those, those marginal pictures are part of the story. And when you think of the, of the journey that that person had to get there, you know, yes, it's troubling, but at least we're there. You know, you've, as I keep on saying, my mum would say, it's good to see your face. Because something that I didn't quite realise until quite recently, shame on me for not realising it, that, you know, we, I, I, when I talk about the, the Middle Passage, I talk about 10% died, you know, something like 1. 1. 1. 1.2, 1.4 million died on a Middle Passage. But there's a there's a back a backstory. People died in Elmina in the holding camps. People died en route to the, to the holding camps in Bonsai Island and Elmina. So this thing, uh, some people put up to ten percent died en route to the to, to the Bonsai Island or Elmina where they're holding, and ten percent died in the. So it's thirty up to forty percent died. You know, so we've got to remember these people. So okay, there's a mark. It's a peripheral picture. But no, we're there. We celebrate your presence now that you existed. So sorry for going on a bit, but it's a, it is something that challenges me. That it, it is it is duplicitous. It is, it is double take in terms of why aren't they why aren't they shown as being people of power, you know, of agency, when in reality it's more complex than that. More complex. And um, just to add to that, like in the um, the National Museum in Havana as well, it's full of images of black people in positions of servitude. Um, and to an extent, yes, while we look at it now and it's deeply problematic, it is to a degree also anthropological. That is what happened. It is, it is a true and real history. And those are, like Michael was saying, records of that history. And to, to kind of abolish them to get rid of them again is it's a form of whitewashing in a different way it's it's actually eradicating then it's taking away responsibility from the people who did it by just pushing it into the confines of history into a corner and saying okay well that's too dark a secret to discuss we don't want to talk about it um actually having it there is important i think contextualizing it is the most important thing and adding more information around those images rather than just having them and saying, okay, with, a, with an attendant, right? Actually trying to uncover some of that information of who that person was or what their role was and then discussing, I think maybe it's something to do with the, the wall panels. There just needs to be more information at people's fingertips rather than it just kind of either disappearing entirely or be staying as it is. Yeah, those are really great points. I think um, re reframing the narrative is a better way to think about our approach to art history rather than, than this um, cultural erasure or historical erasure. Um, so this kind of leads into um, my next question, which um, is very much about the canon, which I think all three of you have touched on a little bit, but um, how has the canon changed since you first began studying or working in the field? It can even, even be um, tra a transition from this um, discussion about um, how narratives or histories are framed or phrased um, to you when you first began versus um, how those narratives are changing or evolving. 
I'm, I'm just gonna start, sorry if I just say, um, when I started at the Courtauld, the kind of books that I was, was getting to read and the theories I was getting to read were things like Baxendal and P Panofsky and, you know, these critics that had existed so long ago. Um, now actually teaching on those courses, um, the literature has changed dramatically. Um, and there is an active push to include. I remember when I was teaching on uh, the global contemporary module and we were adding things by Nelson Canclini, by Mosquera, by Latin American academics and Asian academics and, and black authors as well. Um, so I think it is changing. Again, I think one of the discussions we've had is how fast that change is occurring is possibly not at the pace we would want it to be. Um, there are still, you know, it's slightly disappointing sometimes to see that an Asian art course is three months long, while a Caravaggio art course is also three months long, and you're taking an entire continent and history of a people and comparing that to just one artist. Um, so I think there is still a lot of work to be done in that field and sector, and hopefully it will be done, and we are pushing ahead and trying to get that done. But again, kind of revert back to a point that I, I said earlier in my presentation, for me, the change needs to come from a much lower level. It's not just, I think it's, it's not just, you know, a trickle down thing where it starts at university and then goes down. No, it must come from the base up. So curriculums in secondary schools need to change and how we teach um, the history of blackness and color and nations away from just Europe and North America need to change at that level and then eventually and then of course develop into university um just something one of my students said the other day what a teacher was teaching them about this Pakistani poet and um they were discussing the fruits and the teacher said oh you know the fruits were so exotic because they were trying to describe the identity of this Pakistani person and one of my students put their hand up and was like Miss Chohan said saying it's exotic is racist um and I it was a at first I was kind of like you're kind of missing the point here but okay no you're not it's good that you're in you know that you're engaging with this this discourse and this rhetoric and and that that's where that's how the change is going to come um so yeah I do think it has changed quite dramatically especially from when I was studying where everything was I think our entire study of um art from outside of North America and Europe was a module on Japanese fashion, which was two lectures, a module on uh, Indian miniatures, which again was two lectures, and there was something about Nigerian photography, two lectures, and that was it. After that, it was, you know, looking at the Northern Renaissance or Caravaggio or looking at, I did do a contemporary art module with Julian, which was well, eventually why I ended up staying in art history because it, it actually, Julian Salabrasso approached global art history and the politics behind it, which was for me the most interesting part, but that was one module in three years. So yeah, thankfully it's changing, <laughs> but it could go faster. <laughs> Marenka, do you want to go next and then Michael? Sure. Um, ooh, yeah, I maybe mean, I'm not as optimistic. <laughs> um, um, I do think, no, I've definitely like think I've seen changes, but just as Jasmine said, I think it's, there are more, at least you know, from a university level, more kind of offerings um, within, but again, I feel like it's very much kind of tacked on additions not actually being fully incorporated into the kind of the core of a lot of kind of the um, module, the courses. Um, and I think, I mean, so I work, in, again, I work in a museum, so a lot of things go back to museums for me. <laughs> um, and when you walk into a lot of these museums, um, although there is change, I think, you know, people are still being confronted by the same 
canon, right? And that's where a lot of people, um, not just from the academic world, but most people kind of get that information. And let's be honest, those spaces hold a lot of authority and weight for a lot of, pe a lot of people. You know, when they see something written there, they take it as like, that is um, the truth. And so I think that sometimes, even though there is change within kind of the academic curriculum and stuff, there isn't, that isn't being reinforced outside those realms um, all the time. And if it is, which is always often done on a like, kind of what I call, what we, I call like the project level, you know, so it's not, they're not sustainable um, because they've just gone like, they're done in a way that is, you know, small pots of money, um, short amount of time, someone comes in and once they leave, all that institutional knowledge is lost and it's not continued, it's not embedded in the entire practice. Um, and so, yeah, and so again, I feel like that is just very clear to me saying that, you know, the powers that be don't think that this is something that should be or either don't think or don't understand what like true embedding this kind of work means. Um, it's not enough to just have people come in you know, for a year or two or three, sometimes even shorter than that, um, and then leave. Um, that is not how you're going to kind of change a canon at all. Um, and, you know, that's not how you're going to reinforce long-term understanding of um, different kinds of um, art historical narratives. So, yeah, sorry, that was me being a cynic. <laughs> Rank, there's nothing wrong with cynicism, not wrong with cynicism at all. Can I just pick up on what Jasmine said about the changes? It's not fast enough. I would agree things are happening, but I would even go a little bit further. I'm a little bit, little bit more optimistic because we can ask these questions now. We can we even say, this is art made for white men. This is, we're looking at the collections of white men and we can say it without feeling embarrassed or a bit worried or a bit, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be canceled <laughs> because we're even at a time where now people realize this. I'm gonna say people, I mean, white people realize that, that the art, the kernel of art, the canonical art was founded on, on white property owning men. Women were property, they were marginal. Just as blacks were even more marginal. I don't know if black women were even more, more marginal. But what's happening now? Black women are speaking up, white women are speaking up, black men are speaking up. They're all, they're, they're, there's a, a huge conversation being had. Now, maybe it, it changes not happen fast enough, but the conversation is gone. There's a momentum now. So you see it's reflected in the literature, in the arts, in the plays. It's all out there. And um, for me, and I, I you were knocking back Sindel, Jasmine, but you know, come on, the period eye, the period, what a fantastic concept. I talk about the black eye, the black female eye, the, the, uh, the women's eye. I, I was at an exhibition, not an exhibition, a conference, a lecture a couple of years ago, dementia in the 14th century. Now, come on, look, and we all got new lenses on history now. So it's not just that white narrative, that white male narrative. And it's not even a question of challenging it. They know that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. And, 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 and this is the, the word I love. I, I love. I love to use Obama's word when he talks about history being messy. You know, it's not A, B, then C. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But, you know, if you look at our island story, it's, it's one continuous story of progression from Henry VIII to, um, to Winston Churchill. <laughs> from one success to another. And we know that's not, and we, but now we look at different histories, the working class, as I say, women, black women, men. So these are great times. Okay, change in the institutions may not be fast though, but outside, and as Henry, as Henry Ben, <laughs> Ben, oh, excuse me a second. As Ben said, he talked about change comes from the street and it's happening in the street life. You saw Black Lives Matter, that's all part of that momentum that's creating art and ideas. And the, the genie's out the bottle and it ain't going back in. See, I think that's, uh, first of all, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, bashing Baxendale, just that it was only Baxendale. <laughs> um, but I would just say, I think the fear, and I like oscillating slightly more to the pessimistic side is um, that, seeing well having seen and now studied the movements that are already happening in the UK in the 70s um, and 80s with 
black arts and that's black arts being used in the broadest umbrella that's Asian art black art all people of color um it was disappointing to see that it kind of it was such a strong movement and the people people had so, so much to say and then was just kind of again shoved under the carpet for so long now it's re-emerging again now is a chance where we're starting to see oh actually it did happen and it was really important and people of our generation are now thinking well we actually really chime with that movement and I think now that's the work to be done is to ensure that it doesn't that we don't lose that momentum that it doesn't, get, it doesn't get kind of pushed back into the closet and I think that's why the, the court order is in that sense with the research forum doing good work with that as the conference that I organized last, uh, two years ago or other conferences that have come afterwards to keep that conversation going and at the forefront and not just let it be you know that fad that happened once a couple of years ago and then just disappears again i, I don't i think this is too much has happened on too many fronts yeah, possibly too I many, too, too many fronts. both high culture you know you look at yankish on the yankish on the barrier you look at chris Afili, there the, the um uh lube mohammed they, 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 they are they, they are artists of the day reflecting culture our times not just black but white but british society they're there and yeah. it, so you, you can't take that, you can't put them back in the bottle. Yeah, so I think and it's like that Steve McQueen piece that he did with the exactly. year three, the re, year three yeah, student. Exactly. Very and, and I, and I, I always quote Steve McQueen as the fact that he, he, he won the Turner Prize, high culture. And he also won uh, an Oscar, low culture, you know, we're, we would, and it's British, you know, we're there. We're, I don't think we, I'm maybe like dramatic, but you get where I'm coming from. You know, it ain't going back. It ain't going back, you know, this is, we're going forward. How fast and how, dram you know, how dramatic, well, we, we can discuss. But now it's, 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 a, it's a momentum. And it's, a society becomes more equal, more diverse and more complex, you know, those nice things we need to have. But, and it's happening, it's happening. We're seeing it in, our, in, in, our, in literature, as I say, in film, poetry. It's, it's, I think it's, it's a fantastic time to, to, to be alive in terms of art. You've got so much to look back on but then so much to look forward to. And, and there's, it's a great time to be an art historian, making all those connections, unpicking it. It's fantastic. You, know, you seem to be so knowledgeable. Hang on a sec, it's, it's been there all the time. <laughs> Just open your eyes. Thank you so much. So I think we have um, time for one more question. Um, and I'm gonna um, reflect back on a conversation that we had uh, last week when I think also these similar um, ideas were emerging, especially um, in terms of thinking about the art of the contemporary and how um, a lot of people of color are now being absorbed into these um, ideas of what art is. But um, last week when we met, um, we fell into a conversation about how the canon has co-opted non-Western art is always existing in relation to or in response to European artistic production. But in reality, as we have seen um, from our, our, our speakers tonight, the exchange of ideas and influence is perhaps more balanced or more equitable. So in terms of um, terms like transnationalism and globalization emerging for their relevance to contemporary art, how do um, how does the exchange of ideas or in cultures apply to your work? And should we challenge um, this approach to art history by considering transnationalism as having always existed? Um, and maybe we can start with Marenka and then go to Michael and then Jasmine. Um, yes, I remember this conversation well. <laughs> I think it like had to do with some of my rant about ancient Egypt and museums um, and how that has been co-opted as kind of a very much of a Western narrative and to the fact that you have students not even realizing that like Egypt is part of the African continent, you know? Um, also the fact that like, I keep on asking in our museum, does Egypt just not exist in the last 2000 years? Um, because we have nothing from that, you know, where is, that you know it's just very interesting it's like now we've like other them so they're no longer part of the narrative that we want to tell um uh but yeah but i think when it comes to kind of so i'm actually working on a new collecting project um and which is very much about working with contemporary artists to speak to 
our collections already um, uh, in the museum. And that's been really interesting because what's been coming out of that is that sometimes I get a little pushback um, when I like kind of propose um, collect, well, I've done a lot of commissioning actually of work, not just collecting um, from within the institution because it's not seen as being authentic to that place enough. Um, and what I'm talking, what I mean by that is like, so I'm collecting, for example, um, uh, one of the places I'm collecting from Hawaii is Hawaii, uh, specifically Hawaiian artists. And, um, you know, some of the work they're like, oh, but that's not authentic Hawaiian. My question is, what does that mean? You know, what was authentic 200, 300, 400, 500 years ago? Um, you know, and now, and this, it's kind of this whole idea of like, you know, everyone is like, kind of developed in these like silos. And I was like, no, they've always been exchange of ideas. Um, and so it's just really interesting because in like the work that we're commissioning, what's coming through a lot of it is, you know, how kind of all those different intersections of peoples and cultures are coming through the works of those artists now, um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, which is like really interesting. Um, and, you know, you have people questioning oh, but why does this, you know, like reference something European? We're trying to go for like, you know, um, Hawaiian. I was like, but that is part of the Hawaiian history now. You can't erase that, um, you know? And so it's just, yeah, it's just been very, it's been great because I think all the things that have been coming through the artwork that's been created um, for the, um, during this process has kind of just really, kind of hit home of the idea of authenticity is almost ridiculous. Um, the idea of things are always have always been changing and have always been influenced um, by different uh, people. But also, you know, a lot of times we talk about kind of this exchange of ideas and transnationalism between like Europe and other places when like that, you know, what, what's been coming through with a lot of the work is that's just one exchange. There have been so many exchanges um, and different groups. So, you know, we have some of the artwork we're look, um, collecting this, you know, looking at the history of like Indian Ocean trade and Southeast um, Africa, you know, things that are not really talked, spoken about in at all, but, you know, there is that um, historically, and I might mean historically, I mean historically. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's been just very interesting kind of opening up these news ideas, people being like, oh, wait, there have been all these networks for like centuries, uh, millennia that are now kind of, we were kind of looking at through um, the lens of art. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> okay, I was, I, was, I was being polite then. Art has always been, inter always been international. And that's the fun of being an art historian, unpicking the international. Dan Snow says, and I, I love it, he said this expression, he says, history is what you speak, or what you say, what you eat, and what you were. We unpick it. You can see your history through those. The, you can see your history with those various things. A little, little story I love is because one of the things I love about my Black Magus figure, the differentiation from the other Magus figure, the Black Magus, the, the other, the other three kings, he's always wearing an earring. The Black King always wears a gold earring, and I talk about reference to Africa and gold and all that. But in the uh, six, early 16th, late 15th century, there's talk of of of, of uh, um, a Venetian. And the nobleman was annoyed that his daughter was copying the slave who wore an earring. She was taking the, 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 the fashion from her slave and that she was wearing an earring. And that kind of, that, that to me is internationalism. And that's how it works. The fact that these, this, this, this inter interconnectivity, this exchange of ideas, thoughts, always happening. And that's reflected in the art because, you know, one of the things I believe in, you know, artists, are communicators and they cannot not communicate. They do it. And our challenge as historians is to unpick, is to, is to look at the history and see it there. So to say art is not international is to not be is not understand art. Art is essentially about us as human beings and how we come out of Africa, how we, we came here into Europe and that, that journey that we're on, even true to this day. So no, art is international, period. Um, just, I mean, we were talking about, first of all, how, how modern these terms are, and actually there were terms that existed beforehand that meant the same thing, right? Universalism instead of globalism, et cetera, et cetera. But when we're looking at 
especially the kind of coloniality of, of art and how the canon has been co-opted by you know Western canon. If you look at the kind of moment where most art historians, thankfully not anymore, but for a while, used to cite like the moment that art became globalized, it was with Magician de la Terre. Um, that's quite problematic exhibition, um, where actually something like 80% of the, not 80, but slightly lower, but a large percentage of the artists that were included in that exhibition had shown in Havana in the second biannual in 1986. Um, and in 1989, there was the third Havana biannual that included you know, um, artists, diasporic and artists from Asia, Africa, India, like the, from Latin America, the Caribbean. Um, and it kind of always reminds me this, this idea of, you know, art being transnational or not, or, you know, globalized, the way that trade routes were once drawn on a map and it was always the south going up to the north and then going back out to the rest of the south it was always like the global ports were in the uk or in europe or in north america and actually if you look back further you've got things like that the original trade route which was the silk Road, you know and how ideas were instantly in motion and constantly flowing across the global south as we put it um, centuries ago, millennia ago, even you could probably say. Um, and so I think actually this globalization and transnationalization is more of a Western term and more focused on Euro Eurocentricness than anything else. I think, yeah, Michael's right. Art has always been global. Art has always been international. There has always been an exchange of artistic ideas, taking someone like Wilfredo Lam, for example, um, the way he's written into Western art history is, oh, he was a student of Picasso. Picasso, Picasso and Michelle Larisse showed him um, masks from Africa and that's where he started to pick up the, you know, the motifs of African culture. When the guy is Afro-Cuban, he, his mother was, you know, deeply embedded in Santeria um, and the Yoruba culture. He grew up in that kind of environment in Cuba and actually his biggest influences when it came to his Afro-Cuban aesthetics were, uh, was a Cuban anthropologist, Lydia Cabrera or Alejandro Carpentier. Um, and so, and you know, Lam himself was an international man. His, he was Asian and African and Latin American all at once. Um, so yeah, I think again, those terms as well may need to have a little bit of, or just need some contextualization probably. That's a really great answer. Thank you, um, Jasmine, for that. And um, thank you again to Marenka, Jasmine, and Michael, um, and Ruby as well um, for this really wonderful event this evening. Um, for the sake of um, the time, I think we're going to wrap up and I see some really wonderful questions in the um, comments, but um, hopefully our panelists will be able to answer you um, some other time um, and um, respond to these wonderful questions. But thank you again, everyone so much for um, attending tonight's event. Um, there will be a recording available if you want to see it afterwards. Um, and I hope that these conversations and ideas um, can continue um, long after um, this event ends. Um, but have a wonderful night. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.